Hello statistics students, this is Jamie Amy and this video is our discussion on section 11.1 .1, which is on the goodness of fit. Okay, goodness of fit is a test that um, as statisticians uh, you may be asked to run. Uh, it's a test used um, for hypothesis testing, so to test a claim that an observed frequency distribution fits some claimed distribution. And um, remember when you see the word distribution, think the shape of it. So sometimes there's uniform distribution, which is a rectangular shape, and there's uh, standard normal distributions, that bell-shaped curve, okay? So this is testing that whatever observed frequency fits some claimed frequency, okay? So, requirements. One, the data have been randomly selected. Two, the sample data consists of frequency counts for each of the different categories. Three, for each category, the expected frequency is at least five. Okay, a uh, new variable we're gonna use, capital O, we're gonna use that for observed frequency. So whatever you actually observe. Capital E, you guys have seen a capital E before um, for margin of error, but this capital E is going to represent the expected frequency, so what you expected to observe. Lowercase k, we are going to use for the number of categories. Lowercase n, you guys are used to this one. It's gonna be our number of trials. And our degrees of freedom is going to be k minus one. So that's the number of categories minus one. Okay, if all expected frequencies are assumed to be equal, then you can calculate those expected frequencies with just a simple fraction, and that being the number of trials divided by the number of categories. If all expected frequencies are assumed not equal, then you can calculate your expected frequency by n, divide, uh, n times p. So that would be the number of trials multiplied by the probability of success for each category. That's that lowercase p um, that we have used in past sections. It is the probability of success. Okay, if you take out your graphing calculator and go under stat, then edit, you'll enter the observed frequencies into list one, okay? Make sure those are in list one, and your expected frequencies in list two. And then you'll go to your list of tests by going stat, test, and then it is the chi-squared GOF test. GOF stands for goodness of fit. So how well does what you observed actually fit into the shape of what you expected to observe? Goodness of fit. Okay, to set up a goodness of fit test, it is always going to be a right-tailed test. You're gonna use two capital H's like you're used to, a sub naught, a sub one. Uh, for your null hypothesis, the frequency counts agree with the claim distribution. And for your alternative hypothesis, the frequency counts do not agree with the claimed distribution. Okay, here's a flow chart uh, to walk you through the thought process. Uh, you'll start by comparing what you observed to what you expected to observe. And if what you observed and what you expected to observe are close together, then you would have a small chi-squared value and a large p-value. Here's a graph showing that. And if that is the case, you would fail to reject the null hypothesis, and then you would say that there is a good fit with the assumed distribution. Okay, second case is if the O's and E's, so what you expected to observe and what you actually observed are far apart, then you would have a large critical value for chi-squared, making a small p-value. You would then reject the null hypothesis. You guys are used to this little rhyme, if p is low, the null must go. And then that would lead us to conclude that there is not a good fit with the assumed distribution. Okay, so 
it's nice to go through that entire flow chart, but sometimes you just want a summary. You just want to go, okay, P is low, not a good fit, and the other case would be P is high, good fit. Okay, so use that summary if it helps you, and then um, the flow chart above explains in more detail that summary. All right, let's try an example. A random sample of 100 weights uh, is obtained. The last digit of the weights, when measured, should occur with the same frequency and therefore fit a uniform distribution. Weights when reported, however, tend to end with a zero or a five. Does the sample fit a uniform distribution? Okay, so if somebody asked you right now, how much do you weigh? Um, people tend to uh, round or estimate with a value, a weight that ends in a zero or a five. So that makes sense. Um, but what we are being asked to do as, a status, as the statisticians is look at this uh, report and decide if it was uh, actual measurements or if it was self-reported measurements. And I mean, just looking at it, I'm gonna go with it's self-reported because 46 of the people um, had a weight that ended in zero and 30 of the 100 people had a weight that ended in five. That, those are just too high because um, we know that if we actually measured the weights of all 100 people, then all of these values, this one, 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 and this one should be approximately the same. So a uniform distribution. So this should fit a rectangular shape if we were to graph it, but um, it's not. Only one person <laughs> reported there uh, or had a weight that ended in a one. So this is, this is definitely self-reported, but it's a good example for us to um, apply the goodness of fit test to. Okay, so our null hypothesis is set up saying that the probability of success for each of these categories is equal to each other. So you see lots of equal signs in the null hypothesis. Uh, the sub zero, sub one, sub two, that's, those are the last digits that you see here. These are the categories, okay? So set those all equal to each other in the null hypothesis. And then in the alternative hypothesis, uh, you would say that at least one of those probabilities is different. Okay, let's do this together. Pick up your graphing calculator, or if you're using StatCrunch or Excel, open that. And we're gonna go to Stat, Edit, and that's always where we enter our data. Okay, this is gonna be um, not tricky, but tempting. It is very, very tempting to type this into your list one and this into your list two. You do not wanna do that, okay? Um, list one, I'm sorry, this that you see here, those are just the categories. Those are the last digits. So those are uh, 10 categories, lowercase k equals 10, okay? This right here, this list is what you actually observed. So these are the capital O's for observed. Now if we go back a few slides, um, right here, we need to put what we actually observed in list one. Okay, so let's go back to our example. So list one is going to be the frequencies, the 46, the one, the two, three, three, 30, four, zero, eight, and three. Okay, that is your list one. Okay, so what is list two? List two is what you expected to observe. So if these weights were truly reported, then we would have the same frequency in each category. Okay, so what we expected to observe is lowercase n divided by lowercase k. So there were 100 trials divided by, we've got 10 categories, so what we expected was to have a 10 in each of these 
categories. So maybe I'll add a capital E right here for you. We expected 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and last one there, 10. Okay, so your list two is just 10, hit enter, 10, hit enter. So do that 10 times. So list two has 10, 10. Okay, so the goodness of fit is going to check if what you put in list one is close to what you put in list two. Okay, put how well it fits, goodness of fit. Okay, so hit stat, go over to test, and uh, if you scroll up, if you arrow up, you'll find it faster. Chi squared goodness of fit test, it's option D on my calculator. Open that. What I observed is in list one, what I expected to observe is in list two. My degrees of freedom is the number of categories less one, so that's 10 minus one, so degrees of freedom. D, F equals 10 minus one, so nine, and calculate. Okay, so you have your output screen there, and on your output screen, you have should have a p-value of 6.825 times 10 to the negative 41st. That is in scientific notation. And if you were to move that decimal place um, in to make that number very, very, very small, so you move it 41 times to the left, you basically, you get zero. You get zero point and 40 zeros, then 6825. So that's why the p-value you see here is 0 0.0000, accurate four decimal places, should you be asked. And, and that's okay, all right? It just means your probability of making a type one error is very, very small, um, practically no, nothing. <laughs> and if you compare that to the significance level, always have the default of 0 0.05, unless they specify something different. And so we have our comparison here, that P is low. P is low, the null must go. That means reject the null hypothesis. And we would say that is not a good fit which is what we expected. Okay, so uh, whenever we say reject the null, we always say there is sufficient evidence. This word and this word go hand in hand. Um, so there is sufficient evidence that the sample does not fit a uniform distribution. Uh, a way to summarize that would be, we have evidence that the weights were reported and not actually measured. Okay, and that'll finish our discussion on section 11.1. .1. Thank you for joining me, and see you next time for our discussion on 11.2.